Well, you've got to love that the camel is actually a North American native. There was a little version of a camel. He was no bigger than a jackrabbit called Protolopus. Now we're talking 30 million years ago. And over the epochs, he kind of ebbed and flowed, grew and shrunk. And really the, the connection to Waco Mammoth National Monument is that the camel, uh, in its form, in those uh, few tens of thousands of years ago, acted as a sentinel among the mammoths. He was like a guard. If there were predators on the perimeter, the camels were the first ones to see it. Camel vision is really great, and it's got to be, because in deserts, which tend to be kind of long and flat, you've got to know where food is. You've got to be able to smell water. You've got to be able to see that lone acacia tree a mile and a half away. You've got to be able to see that sprig of grass, that one lone bush. So their eyesight today is likely as good as it was tens of thousands of years ago. You know, we really see the adaptability of the camel uh, both throughout history and prehistory in the two species that we have today, the Arabian camel, the one hump camel that lives pretty much anywhere folks think of camels, be it the Middle East, North Africa, parts of Asia. But the two hump or Bactrian camel is really the one that gives us an insight into those older uh, Arctic or tundra adaptations. The Bactrian camel has long shaggy hair. That means he's adapted for at least a seasonally cold period, winter in Central Asia. The two humps filled with fat, they really have a job in addition to what we're kind of taught as kids. The humps aren't filled with water, they're filled with fat. And on those cold Central Asia nights, the fat which has been storing up heat from the sun all day long, dissipates heat throughout the body. And so again, through the Bactrian, the modern domesticated Bactrian camel, we see some of those older adaptations that the camels needed when they were living uh, in the Arctic regions and on tundra. At some point, the camel thing of tens of thousands of years ago was migrating, and, and not just back toward uh, Asia or Africa to become the Arabian or Bactrian camels, but you've also got a branch of the family that moves south, and they become the Vicuña and the Guanaco. These are wild llama varieties. Then, of course, man, over time, takes these and hybridizes them and turns them into llamas and alpacas. So that really gives us six main members of the modern camel family. You know, there's a lot of conjecture and, and we can't know if the um, prehistoric camels, those that were roaming uh, with our mammoths, would have had a hump or not because it is not uh, the, the hump of the camel isn't supported by a skeletal frame. It is ribs and a backbone, just like a cow or a llama or a horse. So one of the great mysteries may always be, did the prehistoric camels have humps? We can't know because it was just a, it is simply a fat deposit today. But we can, we can have a little insight into those camels of, of prehistory if we look at the environment and the time and the climate in which the camels were living? Was it hot? Did they need that sustenance maybe for times uh, without water, without food? And I think we can fairly look across the, the, the epochs and surmise that those prehistoric camels might not actually have had humps. They likely didn't need them. This was a fairly... Uh, good time in, in terms of resources for animals and wildlife in those times. So the camel likely adapted that hump just over the last few thousands of years as they moved into regions that were much more arid than we're talking about in the 10 to 60,000 year ago range. When you're looking at a camel's mouth, or really any animal's mouth, their dentition is a really good clue to what they eat. Horses, for example, mules, donkeys, zebras, any of the uh, members of the, the Equidae family, they've got teeth on top, big uh, incisors, and on bottom, and they use those like scissors to cut grass. Now, camels live in a slightly different environment, certainly today. They probably shouldn't naturally live 
in a, a fairly verdant mm -hmm. place like central Texas. Now, tens of thousands of years ago, this was a great habitat for camels. Today, it's a little more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. So camels have lower incisors, and on top, they just have a hard gum pad. They don't have incisors on top in front, and that clues us into the diet of the camel. They don't need to cut grass. They're really using their lips more to reach down and pull weeds and brush or up into the uh, occasional tree in the desert and pull those leaves off. So teeth are a real indication as to the diet of an animal. So usually when folks look at a camel today, especially here in the West, in North America, the camel is always looked at through the lens of a horse. People are going to look at a camel and they want it to be a horse. Their comparisons, their points of reference will always be from that of a horse. So I caution folks against these comparisons because they're two completely different animals. But if you're looking at, say, the feet, the feet of a camel are um, squishy, and padded. I don't like the word soft because the bottom of the foot is actually very tough, thick leather, and it's perfect for walking on rock, it's perfect for walking on sand. This is an adaptation, of course, to the environment camels live in today. Uh, comparing or contrasting that to a horse, you're talking about a singular toenail on a horse, that hoof. That's what a, a farrier would nail a steel shoe into if you're shoeing a horse. You can't do that with a camel. They've got two toes, two toenails, and then that thick, leathery pad. For over two decades, my family has shared our camels in public education programs in places like Waco Mammoth National Monument, uh, churches, schools, libraries, museums, historical sites, anywhere that we can tie the camel story today to the camel stories of yesterday or even further beyond. And sharing our camels uh, with the public is its what we love. It's what we do.